We, uh, our next two panelists are former members of Congress who did not stay in the good graces of the Israel lobby. And there's a third one here in the audience today that I'd like to recognize. It's Representative Jim Moran of Virginia, who just retired. Thank you for, thank you. Now, our next speaker was first elected to Congress at the age of 27, becoming its youngest member. Democrat Nick Rahal, a grandson of Lebanese immigrants, represented West Virginia from 1977 until January of this year. Not only has he repeatedly expressed concern about America's relationship with Israel, but he was one of only eight House members to vote against the authorization for use of military force in 2002 that preceded the Iraq War. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, Janet. I appreciate that introduction. I want to thank you and the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, Andy Kilgore, your publisher and founder, Delinda Hanley, Grant Smith, uh, and also the Institute for Research Middle East Policy for putting together uh, this very important conference and for all the work that has gone into uh, making this a success that it is. I want to also recognize a dear friend, besides my former colleague Jim Moran, that's already been recognized, but another dear friend of all of us that's in the room, the Arab League Ambassador Mohammed Al Hassani, who's sitting right Hassini, who's sitting right here on the front row. Mr. Ambassador, good to see you. Wow, after that previous speaker, I guess I'm gonna be kind of tame. <laughs> Uh, and my former colleague, Paul Finley, as well, from whom you're going to hear, but it's so good to see you again, Paul, and to have met your son here uh, as well. My first encounter with the Israeli lobby. Wow, it didn't take long to think about that because shortly after I was elected to Congress in uh, 1977, I, along with a couple of my, other of my colleagues, went to the Middle East. Uh, several in the delegation, Toby Moffat, uh, Mary Rose O'Carr, were of Lebanese ancestry, as I am. And we put Lebanon first on our itinerary. The word got out pretty soon that we were going to Lebanon first. Wow, the lobby swung into action. Don't you know, we know you're a new member of Congress, but don't you know nobody goes to the Middle East without going to Israel first? And then we'll make sure you get into Lebanon or wherever else you want to go. Now, we said no. We had a, made an executive decision and we decided, no, we're going to go to Lebanon first, the land of our grandfathers, and that's what we did. Well, that was my first encounter. Things uh, didn't get much better after that. Uh, a couple years later, 1982, Israel starts bombing Lebanon ostensibly to rid the country, the PLO, and to free its border from shelling from PLO terrorists into Israel. Okay, went on a while. It became pretty clear to myself that this was going a little bit beyond than just ridding southern Lebanon of the PLO when bombs started falling in Beirut. So I took to the floor of the house, made the press back in my home district and everything, uh, pretty critical of Israel that Errol Sharon, then a defense minister, was out of, out of control, that Israel was acting like a monster and wanting to take over not just southern Lebanon, but all of Lebanon. And my statements got press. Speaker of the House, then Tip O'Neill, came to me and said, Nick, I want you to lead a congressional delegation and go to Beirut and what other countries in the Middle East you want, I'll give you the plane, and come back and give us all a report. I said, yes, Mr. Speaker, I'm honored you would invite me to do that. So we had a Codell that July, end of July, 1982. I was the chairman, Mary Rose O'Carr, a member, Merv Dimley, the late Merv Dimley from California, David Bonnier, uh, who later became majority whip of the House of Representatives, Pete McCloskey, uh, you'll recall all of these members, uh, Paul, and uh, Elliot Levitis, Jewish member from Georgia. We took off. We ended up, our whole itinerary covered six countries, meeting with five heads of state. The only one we did not meet with was the King of Jordan, who was unavoidably out of the country at the time. But we went into Lebanon, and we were able to meet with 
Chairman Arafat in the bowels of Beirut at the end of July with Israeli bombs falling all over the place. Several different rendezvous during the course of a 24-hour period to escape our State Department escorts uh, who, uh, you know, were wanting to make sure we didn't do such silly stuff against U.S. law. They kept warning us, you can be in prison for meeting with Arafat, blah, 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 blah. And uh, we went on with it anyway. We came out of that meeting about 4 a.m. that night, and uh, uh, all the press of the world was there waiting for us. They'd already heard about the meeting. Chairman Arafat signed a piece of paper that we uh, put in front of him that said he recognized all U.N. resolutions relevant to the Palestinian question. It's debatable, it was debatable then, it's been debatable since, whether that really meant recognition of Israel or not. I thought, it, I thought and still think it did, uh, although it may have taken a couple years later for him to formally do that, two-state solution recognized, et cetera. But when we came back home, the speaker, of course, very much interested in a report on our trip. We met with him, we met with officials of the White House, briefed them, the National Security Council, et cetera. Well, four of my colleagues, uh, will remain nameless at this point, but they introduced a resolution on the floor of the House to impeach those of us that met with Arafat for treason. <laughs> for treason. New York Post ran our picture, front page, most wanted, with the most ugly mug shots they could find of the four of us that met with Arafat. Now, David, uh, or Elliot Vittis, rather, did not, I must say, did not meet with Arafat. Although the next day we had meetings scheduled with Menachem Begin and Defense Minister Errol Sharon. When the worldwide press hit, we just met with Arafat the night before, they immediately canceled. Elliot Levitis got on the phone to Menachem Begin's office and said, listen, Mr. Prime Minister, this is a Jewish member of Congress. I don't care who my colleagues met with yesterday. You're going to continue your appointment with them, and you're going to meet with them, or you'll have trouble from this Jewish member of Congress when I get back home. Menachem Begin, Defense Minister Sharon, put us back on their schedule. We met with him. Going into Ariel Sharon's office, it became a shouting match right off the bat. We questioned him on the use of cluster bombs against agreements with the United States when they were using those bombs for offensive purposes rather than defensive purposes. And the one thing that struck me right off the bat was a map on the wall in Ariel Sharon's office. There was no Lebanon. There was no Jordan. There were no <laughs> boundaries at all. It was all Israel. Scary, really scary. So fast forward a couple years, we got through 82. Uh, I went back later that year with uh, the late Jack Murtha to view our peacekeeping forces uh, when we were truly peacekeeping forces at the end of 82 when we were there to evacuate the uh, innocent PLO or all the PLO actually from Lebanon to, as part of an agreement. But fast forward to the years of Oslo, 93. Uh, things looked pretty good. I was invited to go with President uh, Clinton, uh, actually in 98, after Oslo, uh, with him to uh, Palestine, to Gaza, when he was the first U.S. president to set foot on Palestinian soil. We opened the Gaza airport. We met with Arafat. Uh, president Clinton spoke to the Palestinian National Council. Arafat spoke right after him. It was all hunky-gory. Everything was great. That evening in the suite of the Camp David, when we had our nightly meeting to find out what all we did during the course of the day, President Clinton was scheduled to address the Knets the next day. He puts his arm around me and he says, Nick, and uh, Sandy Berger is right there on one side and Madeline Albright on the other side. He says, I'm feeling a little bad. I'm wondering if you'll give my address to the Knets tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I thought that Madeline Albright was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> the president, of course, was kidding. <laughs> uh, then in 95, my experience with the Israeli lobby. I get a letter of invitation to go to Israel, May of 1995 with AIPAC. I look at the letter, do a couple double takes. Uh, I say this can't be real. I ask my staff, please verify that this letter came from AIPAC and that this individual really signed the invitation. They checked it out and came back and said, boss, this letter is a real invite, it's not a hoax. I said, okay, I'm gonna accept, I'll go. I think APAC was just as surprised I accepted as I was that they'd invited me. But I did go on that trip, and I said under one condition, and that is that I can sneak over to Gaza, go over to Gaza any way I want to, in order to meet with Chairman Arafat. They thought about it for a couple of days and came back and said, yes, that's fine. I don't think they believed I was really going to do it. Uh, we get in Tel Aviv uh, the night before I'm scheduled to go into Gaza to meet with Arafat. 
APAC finds out I'm serious. I'm really going over the next day to meet with Arafat. So that night, a couple members of the APAC's board comes to me and says, hey, Nick, can we go over with you? Can we go with you? <laughs> so I made some calls, and yes, it was agreed. And the next day, several members of the board of directors of APAC went with Nick Rahal to meet with Yasser Arafat in Gaza. And uh, they were just stumbling over themselves to get their pictures taken with him after our meeting ended up. Of course, things after that's all history, and it's gone downhill. But the lobby, you know, much has been said about the lobby, the Jewish lobby. And uh, it's, it's just so massive and so all-inclusive that it's hard to put the finger on one individual as, back over the previous years. I'm going to get to the present day in a moment. But it's hard to define any one group. And, that, of course, that's their goal. Uh, they, and, and let me say a word about lobbies. It's part of our small d democratic system of government in this country. Any ethnic group, Jewish, Arab, Greek, Italian, Spanish, has the right to organize and petition their government for a redress of their grievances. Democratic right. I have no problem with that. Where my problem comes in is when those lobbies put the interests of the country, foreign country from which they come, ahead of the interests of the United States of America and not registered as a foreign agent, which is also required by our laws of the United States. So to lobby is fine. Uh, and MJ's mentioned the many different lobbies that exist here and uh, uh, the way in which members of Congress react, and I don't deny a bit of that. But I think in the case of the Israeli, the Jewish lobby, they are so many light years ahead of all the others. There may be disagreements within the various groups that comprise the Jewish lobby. There are disagreements, I'm sure. But the public image is presented as one unified voice. The Arab lobby, light years behind. Uh, there's many different groups across this town and across America that represent various Arab groups. They have different agendas, whether it's to fight discrimination, whether it's to lobby to get Americans of Arab descent elected, whether it's to lobby the Congress of the United States, whatever the goal, they're all worthy and good goals. But there's disagreements, and those disagreements between those groups often hit the press much more than disagreements within Jewish lobbying organizations. And of course, as the ambassador knows, there's disagreements in the Arab world among Arab countries. And unfortunately, that, ha that hurts the Arab message, if there is one, uh, when it comes to lobbying uh, the Congress or changing American public opinion. We're making progress, yes. I think the more and more that the media comes around to uh, demonstrating what's happening on the ground in the Middle East, the more Americans and legislators travel to the Middle East, not with APAC, but in an objective fashion, and see the facts on the ground, uh, the more, at least privately, uh, minds are changing in this city and on Capitol Hill. And note I said the word privately. So uh, there are groups that lobby in this town that put America's best interests first. And that is my biggest concern when it comes to the Jewish lobby. There are too many times, and certainly the... Uh, uh, Mersheimer and Walt report of 2006, we all recall that report on lobbying of the lobby in this country, uh, gives numerous examples of where American politicians' minds have been changed when they perhaps almost stepped over that line or maybe even did step over that line and criticized Israel and maybe even used the words my good friend Paul Finley has used, which is, let's have an objective, an objective American foreign policy that allows Americans to be objective so they can bring the sides together to reach a comprehensive peace. But that, as we know, has been a trip word that has caused uh, many a politician to run amok of the uh, lobby and therefore have to retract and have to uh, do what has been described uh, that uh, a certain candidate for Senate in Maryland has just been doing recently. Um, today, ever since 2010, in the Citizens United decision by our illustrious George Bush appointed Supreme Court, the way lobbying is done, the way campaign expenditures are amassed 
is quite different. Today we have unregulated and undisclosed humongous amounts of money being spent in political campaigns. The U.S. Supreme Court and Citizens United opened that up through the Freedom of Speech Clause. Now, I have no problem with freedom of speech. What I have a problem with is the undisclosed nature of that decision, whereby these monies can be given to these independent expenditure groups, and nobody will ever know who gave the money to those groups. Now, when we ran our personal campaigns, uh, every penny coming in had to re be reported, every penny going out had to be reported. But not so with these independent expenditures, and by the very nature of their being legal, they cannot be pro any candidate, they have to be anti, thereby lending so much more to the negativity of our campaigns today and the dysfunctional and dysfunctionality and the polarization of Congress after the, continues after the elections. Uh, this is certainly one of the biggest factors in that dysfunctionality is this Citizens United decision. It's anti, whether it's the incumbent or a, a challenger, uh, and the, the person that benefits from all that negativity, never has to report a penny on his or her campaign expenditure or from where, uh, or anything about the millions of dollars of ads ran against their opponent. What do we know? That lends to the question, what does that person stand for who benefits from all the negative against the other person? We don't know. Uh, never does that person have to say what he or she stands for. So what we've seen is a hijacking of our democracy by these outside independent expenditures. There's front groups, of course. Like in my case, in this past election, the front group was Americans for Prosperity, AFP. The public name associated with AFP are the Koch brothers. Uh, their total expenditure in my congressional race was probably $14 million by most reports. That includes all of the independent expenditures and my opponents spending as well. And again, we have no idea where the money for the AFP, Americans for, Pros Americans for Prosperity, or the Prosperous, whatever you want to call it, uh, we have no idea who gave to them. I don't know whether it was my co-operator's money, I highly suspect it. Uh, I don't know whether Shettle, that Shettle and Adelson's money was involved, I highly suspect it although he had his own separate group that he gave to called the Young Guns uh, that uh, was a part, a major part of the Republican uh, operation last uh, November. Uh, so what we've seen now are these billionaires, whether the Koch brothers, Sheldon Adelson and others, and there's billionaires on the Democratic side. I don't mean to paint this all as one side, but these billionaires using these dark money expenditures have actually dwarfed APAC. I mean, they've made APAC look like a little lamb pauper going around the street asking for money these days. And the perfect example of how I think they're controlling the strings of the Congress was, first of all, this year, the invitation to the Prime Minister for Israel to address Congress without State Department okay, without White House okay, and two weeks before a domestic political campaign in the State of Israel inviting the Prime Minister to come give a political speech before the Congress of the United States two weeks before his toughest re-election of his life. What was that followed up by? A letter signed by 47 senators to Iran, not to the President of our country, but to Iran expressing their deepest problems with what even is not even a deal now of a U.S.-Iran nuclear arms control agreement. And I want one as much as the Israelis, believe you me, I don't want to see Iran develop nuclear weapons. Uh, and I have the same concern a lot of our allies in the region have. But by golly, you don't do it as been described already today by continuing to spread fear. We saw what happened when Ariel Sharon and George Bush the son did that in Iraq. It's Iraq all over again. The falsification of what the threat is, and certainly Iran is not an existential, is existential threat to the United States, uh, and it may be 
to Israel. I'm not, I'm not going to debate Israel politics on that. But there we find Israel and the United States interests diverging, and they're not one and the same. We can deal with Iran in a little different perspective than can Israel. And we should not have 47 United States senators sending a letter to Iran trying to tell them uh, what the Congress of the United States is going to do and how they're going to override the president because th this is just not in our best interest, in my opinion. Now, the fact that these signers... The fact that the gentleman from uh, uh, Arkansas, the originator of this letter, been in the Senate, what, 49 days? I guess he knows everything about the world. But anyway, the fact that he had to deny that this letter was cooked up in a suite of Sheldon Adelson's in Nevada, the fact that he even had to deny that publicly, I think speaks something, uh, too, about where the origins of this letter really came from. There again, we see a hijacking of our democracy in this country by billionaires intent on controlling the Republican leadership of this Congress that is so disheartening, disconcerting, disastrous, damnable uh, to the best interests of the United States of America and to our foreign policy. It leads other countries, it leads other countries to say what's going on in the United States. Are they trusting the prime minister of a foreign country before they're trusting the word of their own president of the United States? Then how can we trust the United States? I mean, the, the, just think about what a message that is. And getting back to the Koch brothers, and MJ referenced this when he talked about how they want to defeat everything uh, other than, I don't think he quite said this, but I'll say it, other than what is oil-based. Here they come into West Virginia and me being the most pro-coal, Democratic member of Congress in the Congress of the United States, and they run a campaign against me being anti-coal, as if they're pro-coal, when you know the real reason is they're pro-oil and gas. That's where they made their money, so why shouldn't they be after the most pro-coal Democrat in the United States Congress? Their own hidden agendas, their own profits is what's running this, and again, I think is frightening for the future of democracy in this country. So uh, let, me, let me try to say one last word uh, about the lobby and, and to say that uh, it would appear that the mere existence of the lobby and all its ramifications in this co country suggests that unconditional support for Israel, unconditional support the blank check mentality, the Pavlovian reflex of so many in the Congress toward Israel is not in America's national interest. If it was, if it was, why would one need such an organized, well-organized, well-oiled special interest group to bring it about? So I conclude by saying, once again, I want to thank everybody that has put this conference together. I think you have provided a forum for some thought-provoking ideas, uh, some debate, certainly much more debate on the question, uh, probably in this one day than I've seen in my 38 years on the floor of the House of Representatives. <laughs> <laughs> but at least the debate is there. Thank each of you. Thank you very much, Congressman Rahal. We'll certainly miss your voice in Congress.